Okay, so let's talk about one aspect of the atheist wars. What are the atheist wars, Craig? Atheist wars are ongoing reality <laughs> for the past at least three or four months, five months. Atheists fight atheists is pretty much all you see on Twitter. Atheists fight atheists constantly. Now, just a quick aside. Um, you know, the, op the operating theory of the anti-theist is that if you do away with religion, people are going to be become intrinsically, by definition, automatically less dogmatic. Well, the atheist wars kind of underscore that that's not true. Uh, one particular atheist war I want to focus on right now is the Steve McRae atheist wars. Steve McRae is not the non-sequitur show, not that. The Steve McRae atheist wars is Steve McRae versus the lack of belief atheist. That's an ongoing one. And to me, the untrained outsider looks suspiciously like a, a what? A debate over dogma. Looks suspiciously like a doctrinal dispute. Because that's exactly what it is. <laughs> that's what it looks like because that's exactly what it is. And one of the first arguments I ever made against an anti-theist on a public forum was on the non-sequitur show. And I said something along the lines of, if you take away religion, people are just going to find ways to, to split themselves into warring camps over atheism. And lo and behold, you have a lack of belief atheist versus a philosophical atheist. Now, full disclosure, when it comes to this, whose side I'm on in the, in the actual substance of the doctrinal dispute, Steve McRae is mostly correct, 85 to 95% batting around in what is essentially true. And there's a reason why they are fighting him tooth and nail, and it isn't what is on the surface, at least not with all of them. Okay, so the arguments against Steve McRae is that there's a colloquial definition of atheism, which means all atheism means is a lack of belief in God. Yeah, and if it sounded like Matt Dillahunty when I said that, it's because pretty sure he and the atheist experience are, are the ones who popularized that definition. All atheism means is a lack of belief in God. Now that's what they are fighting him for. See, Steve McRae, as far as I can tell, Steve McRae is more interested in ascertaining the truth. Okay? Now, you can dispute this, but what he, he doesn't care about popularizing atheism. That's not his agenda. So he's not going to adopt all atheism means is a lack of belief in God, just because it's easier for atheists to carry that around, create more atheists, and win debates under that, that definition. It's a lot easier. That's why people, that's why it got popularized. What Steve McRae cares about, as far as I can tell, is actually the truth of the matter. So he is dealing with the, with the definition of atheism that leans more on philosophical atheism, where there is a proposition in play, and that proposition is God does not exist. Now, here's where it gets really interesting, because there's a reason why Matt Dillahunty, for example, actually fought him a lot on this. Now, Matt Dillahunty wins a lot of atheist debates. He wins almost every debate I've ever seen him in. The only debate, the only exception was when he debated Michael Jones on um, the sociological utility of religion. Michael Jones won that debate hands down. Why is that? Because the facts, the, the fa Michael Jones came prepared and the facts were on his side and Matt Dillahunty had enough intellectual integrity to ultimately yield the point. He wound up saying, as I pointed out in the past, somewhere in that debate, just because something is useful doesn't mean it's true. Why is that interesting? Because it's yielding the point. Religion is useful. I accept that. They build hospitals, they build, he even said with, in that debate, they build hospitals, they build orphanages under the name of religion. So he yielded the point in the debate. Every other debate I've seen him in are the does God exist debates, and he wins almost every single one. Why is the question? Why? Because he defines the parameters of the debate before he enters. And all he is trying to defend, all atheism means, is a lack of belief in God. That is not a rational justification for the proposition God does not exist. And he kind of knows this. In fact, what that is, is a rational justification for his lack of belief. Oh, interesting. That's why they're fighting Steve, Steve truth and truth and now. He's trying to be more precise in the actual definition. If you're actually an atheist, somewhere along the way you do kind of believe God does not exist. But what you are defending publicly is your own, you are providing a rational justification for your own lack of belief. That's what Matt Dillahunty does publicly. It's why he wins every single solitary debate and wins them easily. Why? 
Because ultimately, all he's got to go, go back to is, look, I'm just not convinced. What Kalam? Look, I'm not convinced. Kalam, I'm not convinced. Easy. It's easy to win a debate to rationally justify your non-belief. Now, when some of the things that I pointed out with my own particular elephant epistemology series, that is not a rational justification of the proposition God exists. That is a rational justification of my belief. See the difference? I've even used a bunch of analogies to underscore that fact. If I have a migraine headache, I don't need any rational justification for a migraine headache. Its experience is its, I experience its own reality. Ow, my head hurts. Ditto for my belief as I practice it. I don't need to rationally justify it to myself. Why? Because it disappeared in my prayer closet, as I've said a thousand times in other videos. And it's 150% real to me. Thanks. And I believe me 150%. So I am rationally justifying my belief. Now you say, I'm an atheist, I don't believe you. I get that. But I do believe me. And all I'm trying to pop, pop, point out was, was trying to clarify that that is not a rational justification for the proposition God exists. It's a rational justification for my belief. As I said, if I open, a, open the door and see a cat, someone says, there Someone says, is there a cat in the bedroom? I open the door and see a cat. I am rationally justified to believe a cat. Now, smart aleck atheist goes, what if you rush to open the door and see a unicorn? Implying quite clearly, see, this is where it gets a little interesting and a little bit, you have to be a little bit more precise. Implying quite clearly that I don't know the difference between reality and unreality. I do, thanks very much. When I say something is 150% real to me, and you all believe that it is, I don't mean I'm completely nuts and insane. I am perfectly capable of discerning the difference between reality and unreality. So when I tell you I disappeared in my prayer closet and I have a powerful, connected, internal experience where God is 150% real to me, as I pointed out in the past, you hear something completely different. You hear something far more disconnected from reality than what I actually experience. You hear, I disappear into my prayer closet, angels fly out of my rear end, hear everybody, heal everybody in the street, and fly directly back into my rear end. That's what you hear. And that's what you pretend I'm saying, but that's not what I'm saying. And then you pretend I go, and I just believe it so, just by faith, so and so. Little men paint my ceiling at night, and then the paint disappears by the morning. I just know it's true. That's not what I've ever said. That's what you, but a lot of atheists pretend I said. See the difference? Now, if you want to decide for yourself, if I, your humble apologist, am tethered to reality, uh, first of all, I think it's pretty obvious, but I have videos on other subjects. I do a few videos here and there on, for example, Joe Biden. You can go listen to those videos, and you, you might not agree with me, but you'll be able to clearly distinguish that I understand the real world and how it operates, and I'm pretty tethered to reality. And I can very readily uh, understand the difference between reality and unreality. So if I were in a situation where you and atheists were trying to ascertain whether, whether there was reality to my experience, rather than just trying to bust my balls, see the difference? Because oftentimes that's what an atheist is really just trying to do when, you, when you're one-on-one -on -one with them. They're just trying to bust your balls. They aren't trying to find out if you're telling the truth and if there's reality to what you, are, you, what you think is true. Because this is the only way it would go. If you start asking honest questions, which is exactly what a scientist would do, by the way. Scientists would be disinterested. He would ask me questions from a place of disinterested, dispassionate. You'd find out, the first thing you'd find out you gave me a fair hearing is, one, I am telling you the God's honest truth, as far as I know, 150%. I am not lying at all, and nobody has ever accused me of lying. Two, you would find out that there's a phenomenon going in my life going on in my life, real time, real place, that you can't explain. That's the best that you could, best case scenario for the atheist counter argument to my particular experience. That's the best case scenario, that's the best you're gonna be able to do. Ideally you go, yeah, Craig, <laughs> sign me up for your church, there's something going on here, and I, I, I'm feeling it. But barring that, any other, any other outcome is you ginning up on reality yourself. Now, let's get back to Matt Delonge because this is really revealing. As I said, he does not shop around. 
He does not, nor has he ever tried to publicly give a rational justification for the proposition God does not exist. Why? This is really interesting and this is potentially very illuminating. Why? And why does he fight Steve truth and now when Steve is trying to get atheists to kind of sort of do that? Why are they fighting him so hard? Because it's literally almost impossible to do. Because he'd lose. He'd lose every debate and he'd lose them all the time. He'd lose them easily. He'd lose. Did I stutter? No. Because he'd lose. He'd lose every debate. He'd lose them all the time and he'd lose it easily. If you don't believe me and you're an atheist, Try it out. Don't do it publicly. Do yourself a favor. Do it in private. Instead of just trying to say, I don't believe you, the theist, try to actually rationally justify the proposition God does not, not exist. Do it with even though you can, you can pick almost any theist. They can be a weak theist. They can be a great theist. You can do it with G-Man. You can do it with Craig Reed. Anyone in between. Do it in private. Why? Because you're going to lose. Go. Call up Stephanie. Stephanie will do it. Call up Stephanie and go, Stephanie, I, I want to talk to you on the phone. I'm going to prove to you, I'm going to now prove to you, Stephanie, that God does not exist. She'll win. Easily. She'll run circles around you. She'll beat you easily. Matt Dillahunty will lose easily. That's why they're not doing it. Because it's almost, literally almost impossible to justify. Now, here's a fact. And this is a very illuminating fact. So, so be, this, this is actually a fact. Think about this. Because this is actually more revealing than you realize. I know about 200 atheists. I know pretty much from Twitter and YouTube and the atheists that I interact with and then the, outside of the circle, the people I know. I pretty much know or have connected with or listened to almost every single atheist out there producing content. From, you know, the, the basically nobodies to people like Sam Harris and almost everybody in between. About 200 atheists I've clicked on at least a little bit of their videos, watched a little bit of their arguments, listened to some, read some of their blogs. I, I know pretty much almost everybody in the circle. I've clicked on almost everybody there is out there, right? With one or two exceptions, maybe a handful of people that, I, that I don't, haven't heard of or haven't listened to any of their videos. And I'm guessing it's about 200 or so people, maybe as much as 300 people, right, who are making videos about atheism, who are making arguments, counter-arguments, counter-apologetics, things like that. And I've watched, let's say, three, three, 300 of them, I've watched at least an hour of something they've done. Of those 300 or so people, do you know how many make arguments for the proposition that God does not exist? Do you have any idea how many? Only one. There's only one I've ever seen try. Honestly. That's really interesting. That's really illuminating. There's only one I've ever seen try. That's Crocoduck. That's it. It's the only one I've ever seen try. He tries to actually make apologetics for the proposition God does not exist. Now, here's the interesting thing about him. As far as I can tell, intellectually, the guy is brilliant. Honestly. Really, really first-rate intellect. I could be wrong about that, but it seems to me like he is really, really hyper-intellectual, hyper-intelligent. Because he, he has made, or tries to make arguments for the proposition, rationally justify the proposition God does not exist. The only one I've ever seen try. Nobody else has ever tried. Not Matt Dillahunty, not Sam Harris, not Richard Dawkins, nobody. Not Christopher Hitchens, nobody. Nobody. Think about it, nobody. He's the only one I've ever seen try. And what's scary about him is that he is smart enough to make convincing arguments, but his arguments amount to crazy talk. Honestly, crazy talk. Crazy talk. Literally. Insane stuff. And he's smart enough to make it semi-plausible. I saw him in a debate try to argue, literally, literally argue, that there is no such thing as mathematical truth. Honest to God, I saw him do it. That mathematical truths are created truths. That's crazy talk. That's complete and utter insanity. That's the road to complete incoherence, complete insanity. That's total crazy talk. And he almost made it convincing in that debate. Where am I going with this? Why is this relevant? Because in order to rationally justify the proposition, God does not exist. The reason why most of you aren't doing it is literally almost impossible to do. 
Literally almost impossible to do. That's why Matt Dillahunty doesn't try. That's why he got, gets mad at Steve when Steve kind of implies that he should be trying. Steve doesn't care about popularizing atheism. He doesn't care if Matt Dillahunty wins debates or loses debates. He doesn't care if atheists win the day. He only cares kind of about what's philosophically true. If you try to rationally justify the proposition God does not exist, you will find out how incoherent it actually is. In order for Crocoduck to even have to attempt to try, he has to deny basic reality. He has to ascribe to real things that we all know are truths, objective truths, not debatable like morality, which I think ultimately won't be debatable, but it's still debatable now. Mathematical truths, things that people have known are true truths since, since the beginning of time. Things that if you actually argue their unreality, you undercut basic reality itself. You have to argue the unreality of actual, actual real in order to make that proposition make any type of coherent sense. That's very illuminating. That's why I say try it. Let's go Stephanie. I'm going to prove to you God does not exist. You won't be able to get five minutes into the argument before Stephanie will start cleaning your clock easily. Why? Because it's really hard to make coherent sense of that proposition. It doesn't cohere. In order to make that, co that proposition make coherent sense, you have to argue against the basic reality of facts, like mathematical truths. That's what Crocoduck was trying to do. Argue that mathematical truths aren't really true, they're created truths. And you can hyper-intellectualize it so that it sounds convincing, but that's insanity. Honestly, that's insanity. And that's where some of these people can get really scary, even in the ultra-egghead zones. Because, you know, someone, someone is really, really, really smart. They can make a convincing argument for complete chaos. That's the road to complete chaos. That's basically arguing the real is not real. The discovered real isn't discovered real. It's total insanity. It's, to it's crazy talk. It's total crazy talk, I promise. It's crazy talk. So... Shop it around. Try it out for yourself. Try it in private, though. Try and shop around the proposition God does not exist. You will, you will lose the debate. Matt Dillahunt, he's sort of in... I don't know if he actually consciously understands why he rejects Steve's, Steve's so much, or if he just intuitively kind of understands that this is going to upend him. Because he goes into 80 debates on does God exist. He wins almost every single one. But he is not rationally justifying the proposition God does not exist. He is rationally justifying his non-belief. That's really easy to do. <laughs> and you do it like this. All it means a lack of belief in God. All it means is I don't believe you. All it means is I doubt what you're saying is true. Easy to do. If you call upon an atheist to try to flip it around and ascribe to the atheist the burden of proof, it becomes well nigh impossible. That kind of tells you something right there. I think that's really illuminating. You, the atheist, probably, pff, I don't really think it's all that illuminating, Greg. I don't think it really applies to anything. Yeah, it really kind of does imply something, actually. Because every Christian apologist you know shops a version of some sort of apologetic that proves God exists. There's no atheist that do it. Crocoduck, that's it. No other atheist has a God does not exist, I can prove it. No other, no, go show me anybody else. Nobody that anybody's heard of. Nobody else. Nobody else does it. Promise. Nobody else does it. Nobody else even tries. Why? It's almost, literally almost impossible. Now, in terms of proving God exists, as I've said in the past, no. Apologetics as they stand aren't successful, but they're close. And when I say they're close, I mean they're really darn close. I mean, within a year or two, they may, actually, they may actually do it. It's not that hard to do. Apologia could do it, honestly. <laughs> it's funny. It's a, that's a really weird thought, but it's really true. He had a thing on Twitter about, uh, I guess, five months ago at this point. He was asking, you know, this is low-hanging fruit, me taking, off, taking apart William Lane Clegg's arguments. And, you know, here's an argument here, the, the Kalam argument. That's what he does. He, he debunks a lot of the, uh, the standard apologetics out there. And he goes, this is low-hanging fruit. Is there any arguments out there that are any good? And I pointed out that there's one that's almost good, and that's Phaser, the fourth, the fourth the argument from eternal truth of the fourth one of Phaser's five proofs of God. The fourth one is almost good. It's not successful as it stands, but it's getting close. And it argues from eternal truth, because there are such things as mathematical truths. Kind of similar to a tag argument, kind of similar to a pre-sub argument. But here's what's interesting. It's so close 
that actually Polygia could solve it. It's close enough that a reasonably intelligent atheist, that's what I'm saying, we are, we are close to actual proofs of God. Close, really close, like close like a year or two from actual proofs where God will be literally proven. Apologia could probably take the argument from eternal truth, tinker with it a little, give, it, give, it, give the attributes of God as classically understood by classical theism, and then make it, make it round it out himself. That's how close it is. <laughs> it doesn't work as it's framed, but he could probably close it off and make a, make a solid proof for the existence of God. It's got to tell you something right there. It's got to tell you something right there. In order to try to rationally justify the proposition God does not exist, you have to upend basic reality. You have to try to prove that mathematical truths aren't true. And if you can do that, you know, God help us all, because that just means you've outsmarted, <laughs> that just means you're smart enough to, to talk crazy talk and have people think it makes sense. That's all that it means. You can talk crazy talk in a hyper-intellectualized way and people think it makes sense. Mathematical truths are bedrock foundational truths. You, I think moral truths are too. But that's still up for debate. But I don't think that will be up for debate in two or three years. I don't. Moral foundation theory is already close to closing that gap. I think I almost closed the gap with my arguments. You know, everyone else disagrees. But whatever. Whatever. You guys don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Listen to the videos again. But we're close. There, there's close to actual proofs of God. No, none of them work as framed. But here's the thing. Once you get them working as framed and they actually prove God, guess what? That's the end of it. Then God is proved. Period. It's the end of the debate. It's the end of the discussion. God is proved. God is proved. Using the tools of logic, using, using abstract, if A, e, if A equals X, logical conclusions. It's, then it's over. And the, like I said, or what, like I just said in this video, we're pretty close to that. So, I don't know. I don't know. Just, just some thoughts. So, there you go, kids. That is all for now. Amen.